Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today we are continuing to investigate calendar anomalies on stock markets, and today our topic is whether you should sell in May and go away. And it is associated with monthly anomalies pronounced on stock markets, to verify the existence of which we'll use 60 years worth of daily data for S&P 500 index, starting in 1960 and ending at year-end 2020, so plenty of data to check. Here we have got daily S&P 500 indices and daily returns, calculated using the usual formula. And the sell in May and go away advice has become quite prominent, has become a conventional wisdom among practitioners and regular individual investors because of the existence of some monthly anomalies that have been well documented at least since 1980s. And the first two anomalies we'll investigate are the so-called January effect and April effect. Those imply that average returns would be much higher in January and April, and there are tax-related reasons for such anomalies. January and April are fiscal year ends at some notable jurisdictions. As such, January is the fiscal year end in the US, and April is the fiscal year end in the UK. So some investors, most notably wealthier ones that have high incomes and can be taxed at higher rates as they fall into higher brackets in progressive uh, income tax systems, they might be incentivized to buy excessive amounts of stock in January and April to lower their declared incomes and uh, get a proportion of their incomes to be subject to lower capital gains tax rates. So to investigate whether January and April effects are pronounced and uh, to investigate what are average returns across all 12 calendar months, we'll have to use the month function in Excel that can retrieve the number of the month we're currently at. So we impose the month function onto our column of dates and we get quite intuitive month numbers. One for January, 12 for December, two for February, and so on and so forth. So quite obvious and intuitive. And now we can start calculating how many observations have we got for each of the months. So we can count if the column of months lock in the rows over here as we don't want it to change and refer to the month number we have got in this column over here. And we can see that we've got 1,274 observations for January, quite a bit lower for February. Well, there are less days in February, uh, corresponding to less trading days, isn't it? And we have got more than a 1,000 observations for each and every month. So that's quite robust. There is quite large samples. So we can start identifying the average returns in these months. To do that, we can use the average if function and again, refer to the column with month numbers locking the rows again, referring to the month number we have got over here, and calculating the average of returns that we've got in the neighboring column, locking the rows as well. And we see that the average daily return in January is five basis points. There are also notable uh, high average daily returns in April and also November and December. So not only January and April have higher than average returns, if you look at the pattern identified in the table. Graphically, we can use at this pre-constructed chart and see that indeed the highest spikes are April, month number four, and November, month number 11. January is not really that prominent as a source of very high average returns. However, we'll still test whether the difference of average returns in January and April and uh, all other month is statistically significant. To do that, we can code two dummy variables for January and April effects using the following logic. If the month number is equal to one, so January will return one and zero otherwise. So this will give us a dummy variable equal to one in January and zero for all other months that can be used in a dummy variable regression to see whether average returns in January 
are substantially higher than in all other months. And for April, we do exactly the same, remembering that April is the fourth month of the year. So if the month number is four, then we return one and zero otherwise. And now we can already regress our daily returns onto those two dummy variables to get any idea on whether average returns in April and January are higher than average returns in all other months for potentially tax-related reasons we have discussed before. And uh, the most comprehensive source that discusses various reasons for uh, those monthly effects is perhaps Thaler 1987 article in Journal of Economic Perspectives. There are earlier studies on that, but Thaler perhaps identifies it in the most uh, clear fashion. So we can use a Linus template, selecting a 3 by 5 array and applying the Linus function to the array of our daily stock returns and the two dummy variables identifying January and April effects respectively. And we can input one because we want the constant in our regression that would be interpretable as average returns in all months but January and April. And we need another one to report additional statistics. And we need standard errors and degrees of freedom to execute t-tests for our coefficients to determine whether they are statistically significant and different from zero. And we can enforce this formula using shift control enter and get estimators of average return in all months but January and April and of the differences between returns in January and April and all other months on average. And we see that the daily return on average in all other months is around three basis points with returns in January higher by two basis points on average and in April higher by five basis points. So we can see even here that in terms of the magnitude of the effect, April effect is more pronounced than January effect, quite surprisingly, as in the US, again, the fiscal year ends in January. So what is going on there? Well, to have a clearer picture, we can calculate the t-stats for our coefficients, dividing the coefficients by the respective standard errors, and we can determine statistical significance of these effects by using the two-tailed t-distribution. And then we can input the absolute values of the t-stats and the number of the degrees of freedom reported in the Linus template over here. And we can see that the p-values for our monthly effect coefficients are both higher than 10%. For April, it's marginally insignificant, uh, a little bit higher, and it would break through the 10% threshold. However, we still need to concede it's statistically insignificant in such a specification. And our January effect is insignificant uh, in any specification we could possibly have. The p-value is much, much higher than the tolerable level of 10%. However, the average return in all other months is uh, remarkably positive and significant, meaning that you're not getting uh, the statistically significant returns, positive returns, only in the months of April and January. There is positive risk premium for the market risk in other months of the year, so no significant pattern is established for April and January effect on the US stock market for the 60 years in question. However, there might be a more nuanced pattern that is associated with the sell in May and go away heuristic. And that has been proposed first by Burton and Jacobson in 2002, and it revolves around looking at this pattern uh, in a little bit higher detail. We can see that returns in all months um, between May and October, that is June, July, August, and September, are quite low and fluctuate around zero. At some points, the returns in particular months are even negative. We can see that the return in June is not distinguishable from zero at all, even looking at the chart, and the average return in September is even negative. And Burton and Jacobson suggested that there is a robust seasonal anomaly around uh, the annual pattern of the stock markets that suggests that after May end, bearish market patterns are more pronounceable, and uh, they continue up until around October. And that is why the sell in May and go away effect is also called Halloween effect, because investors start uh, again accumulating bullish sentiment about the stock market around October, around end of October when Halloween is celebrated. So the idea of the sell in May and go away effect, or the Halloween effect as it's alternatively called, is to only invest uh, on the stock market in October through May and sell it 
all at the end of May and invest in other assets, for example, the risk-free rate, bonds, whatever you want, and uh, hold it until start of October, and then buy it back, and again, enjoy uh, high and positive abnormal returns across the period of the year until the next May, and so on and so forth. So to code whether we have got the sell in May and go away effect statistically significant across our 60 year period, we can code another dummy variable for the Halloween effect. And that would be equal to one. If our month indicator is less than or equal to five, well, we sell in May, but we hold it until the end of May, isn't it? And if it's not less than or equal to five, we need to check whether we are in October yet, because if we're in October or November or December, we need to buy it back. So if it's less than or equal to five, we return one, we are in the period we would hold the stock market. But if it's greater than five, we need to check whether we are in October yet, because if we are in October, we need to buy it back. So if our month indicator is greater than or equal to 10, we still hold and we only sell if it's June through September. And this easy formula allows us to code the Halloween effect or selling main go away effect dummy variable that we can use in another regression. Selecting a two by five array using the Linus function and regressing our return array onto the dummy variable that we've just coded. And again, one for constant, one for additional statistics, closing the brackets and using shift control enter to enforce the Linus formula. And here we see that average returns June through September are just equal to zero and the significant difference well we can estimate how significant it is by using a t-test in a little bit but we can see that the difference is four basis points october through may uh, with regards to uh, all other months that are being left out while we sell at the end of may and buy back at the start of october to get the t-stats and the p-values we can copy these formulas across and we can see that in that case, the Halloween effect, the effect of uh, average monthly returns October through May is significant in 5% with a comfortable enough T-stat in excess of two. While the T-stat for the returns of the market in other months is very, very low and statistically indistinguishable from zero, meaning that the sell and main go away effect persists while the more conventional April and January effects are not as robust as you might think. And that's all there is for the monthly anomalies in stock returns, January, April, and Halloween effects. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.